So how does this ideal gas law simulation actually work under the hood? Well, we have these various constants that we've set up, as well as these initial values, and these are all just numbers that are happening. We've assigned the C, I, and D to be basically constants that if I see a D, I know that signals that this number represents something in the code. Down below, we've got our ID universal gas constant, and then basically a series of X and Y locations for all of those balls on the screen. So this computer screens are a lot like normal Cartesian coordinates with the Y axis upside down, but there's everything has an X and a Y location on the screen. They all have speeds, they all have angles. There's a whole bunch of setup dealing with starting pressures, adding pressure over time, uh, the rectangles that we're drawing, and then uh, all the points that are going to be part of our simulation. Setup just mostly does, okay, what are all your starting values going to be? What's your pressure going to be? Are you going to have your volume be your dependent or your moles or your temperatures or your pressures and so on? And it's also trying to help override that if somebody puts in a dozen dependent variables, well, four dependent variables, it only picks the first one. Then we have constants and independents that are calculated after that. So that's all the setup for, okay, how do I figure out how much of a step to take each time? Because I'm actually just taking my initial value, my final value, and dividing by the number of steps in my simulation. And that's what I'm going to add every time to those bars that you're seeing. So drawing. This is basically something that just continues to go over and over and over again as the simulation is going along. It's checking to see how many steps in our simulation we've had before we reach the end of it. While that still has more to go, it checks the various values and adds to them. To relocate the ball based on the number of moles and how much it's doing, the X and Y positions of all of the balls that are in the little container area and calculates the y position of your bar graph based on that. All of these things now are actually going to draw everything, draw the rectangles, draw the bar graph, draw the line graph, so setting up all of those points. We have a utility thing which says, okay, what direction do you go, especially if you run into the sides of your uh, container. You check your various limits for your starting and ending positions. This was so that if someone puts in 10,000 for their starting thing, we go, no, you can't do that. You set it to 600. You never know when some crazy person will put in an unreasonable value in a simulation. This places all the balls initially. This basically does the calculation for uh, velocity and relocates them to the new X and Y position. This draws them. So all of these things are ellipses. So figure out your X and Y location, uh, what your angle is going to be, and then basically just fill them in with this particular thing here, this color. So it's just drawing a circle at that point. You draw your side rectangle, you draw a bar graph. Uh, bar graph is the one that just has a series of the PV, N, and T, and then it's drawing just the rectangles that are particular colors. These uh, little symbols here are hexadecimal color schemes. If you've ever seen web pages, this is what they use for colors. This is red, green, and blue values. The line graph is actually a series of points, so we're just actually continually adding more and more points to those lines. And so what you're seeing is a whole bunch of little dots that are all placed next to each other to make the illusion of a line. If they happen to all go up at the right angle, then it looks like a straight line, otherwise it looks like a curve. We have our x-axis actually drawn, and then the key, which is in the graph itself when we run it, the key is this little area up here. So that's how the simulation works under the hood.